Lord, thanks for tonight. God, we do pray that you would move in our hearts. We want to learn what it is to walk closer to your son. And we, we, we don't want to do that because, I don't know, for a strange reason, we just want to do it because we want to be close. You call us into relationship, and I desire that for all my brothers and sisters, Lord, that they would seek to have a close relationship with you and walk in the light, just like the Apostle John's going to exhort us tonight. So have your way in our hearts, Lord. Draw us closer to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. First John chapter 2. I got to teach the first uh, chapter 1 of this. It was about four months ago, five months ago, so I'm entitled to do a little bit of an overview. Um, Apostle John, he's like one of my favorite guys. He uh, well advanced in age when he wrote this letter, probably close to 100 years old. Um, he's the only apostle not to die a martyr's death. All the other guys did. Um, leg, uh, legend or uh, tradition has it that uh, the apostle John, they tried to kill him and they put him in a vat of boiling oil and the Lord preserved his life and God can do that. And he went on, and they, they exiled him eventually to Patmos and he wrote the three epistles in the book of Revelation there. Um, but just a, a wonderful guy, like a grandpa in the Lord. Um, John, remember, said to, Jesus said to John from the cross, uh, in John 19, he said, woman, behold your son, Jesus is dying, he wants somebody to take care of his mom, and he says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. So it's thought that what happened with the apostle John was he stayed in Jerusalem, he cared for Mary until she passed away, and then he got out of Dodge, probably got out of there before the, the city was ransacked in 70 A.D., and what and he ends up in Ephesus, in the area of Ephesus, which really in the first century becomes the central uh, place for Christianity the, the, around the city of Ephesus and that whole region up there in, um, that's modern-day Turkey, right? Asia, Asia Minor used to be. Um, and he stands, at the, the thing, another historical accounting of John I read was that they, late in his life, at 90 or 100 years old, when he, before he was exiled, they used to take him around this whole region. And they would, and if, if you can think of this for a moment, here's the last surviving apostle, walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, pretty exciting guy to go see. And they, they, they moved him around the region, and he would stand up in the midst of the people that would gather. And people would come from all over, the apostle John, apostle John. people would travel to see the apostle John. And he'd stand up, and he wouldn't say very much. He would say, little children love one another. And it sounds really simple and really trite and real, uh, not a lot to it, but it's so deep. It's so, it's so much more than uh, just a simple little command. I, I'm, I, it reminds me when Billy Graham came to Sacramento, gosh, a number of years ago. That had to be in the 80s. Is, was anybody, did anybody go to that outreach? Yeah, it was fantastic. And my mom was about 78 years old then, and she loved Billy Graham and wanted to go see him. My mom was a uh, Catholic gal. She thought I was crazy. Eventually, she came around to thinking when I became born again, and then she eventually came to the point where she said, oh, he's not crazy. And she, well, she listened to Sam once, and she figured out he was sane, and uh, <laughs> you know, just barely. I'm just kidding, Pastor Sam. Um, but what happened was she saw the change in my life, and she thought, wow, this is something. Something's going on. But she always did want to go see Billy Graham, so we had that opportunity to go see him. And this kind of, this little story about the Apostle John reminds me of that. It was, a, it was a youth night down in Sacramento, so the music was really loud and obnoxious. You know, for us old guys, I was about 45 at the time or whatever. Um, but for my mom, 78, you know, yeah, it's pretty loud, but it was a great evening. Billy got up and did his thing. We got to see him preach. The spirit moved. And my mom stood up and received the Lord. Amen. And she stood up. You know, Now, she, I'm not sure that she wasn't sealed, but she wanted to make sure, you know. She wasn't under, I, I don't think she was getting taught the word in the way that we do in this church. And she stood up. I, the, he's doing the invitation. I notice her standing, and the tears are coming down her face. And I'm going, wow. And Billy Graham was an anointed teacher and uh, awesome gifted evangelist in, in, in our generation, too. So that's what that reminds me of. But let me go back and read 1 John 1 through 4, because I think it's really good to set this as a precedent. And this is the Apostle John 
writing to his kids, that's us. He says, that's, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our eyes have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, us that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So John is testifying the, to the fact that he walked with Jesus, he talked with Jesus, he was Jesus' friend, close friend and confidant for a number of years. And he's writing these things to us and the kid, his spiritual kids that our joy might be full. And that's the first reason he writes this letter. There's a couple others that we'll look at. But um, at the end of the Gospel of John, I like what John wrote about Jesus. He said in John 21, 25, when he's wrapping up his gospel, he goes, there are also many other things that Jesus did, which they were written one by one. I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And I'm thinking, what an amazing perception of the Lord Jesus John had. He got to walk with him. And Jesus is infinite, right? He's the Alpha and the Omega. You can't fill up the book, the books would fill the world and beyond all the, all the things that the Son of God has done. So I just want to mention that he's well acquainted with the Lord, and now out of a heart of love for his spiritual kids and grandchildren, that's us in this room, he's going to give us some practical instruction on how to walk in this life with Jesus, that our joy might be full. And I should say also that this book emphasizes the family relationship we have. Um, Paul often talks about the body of Christ, which is a very, very good description of how, the, how we work together as believers, many parts, different functions. John is more of an emphasis on the family nature of what we are together. In other words, I'm stuck with you and you're stuck with me. We're family, right? We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And it's very relational. And we all learn differently, don't we? Everybody, so, you know, because later in this chapter, we're going to talk about if you hate your brother, you're walking in darkness. And so some of us brothers and sisters may be a little bit harder to like than other brothers and sisters. But we're all so different. I'm, I think of when my kids all learned to ride bikes. My first son, kind of the dutiful firstborn Greg, put him on a bike, and he... Uh, listened to instruction. He was old enough. He really focused. And then, you know, we walked along with him, and, and he got it down eventually. You know, he was old enough, and he learned how to ride the bike. My second born, Timmy, had a little buddy down the street that learned to ride the bike before him. Timmy had no reason to ride a bike at this point. I don't remember how old he was, about three or four. And it wasn't those little midget bikes they have now that kid, kids can ride. It was, you know, a big wheel thing. But Timmy was so determined, since his buddy was riding a bike, that he was going to learn to do it. So we were at the ball field one day, and there was these paths with a lawn on either side. And we're trying to say, Timmy, take a break. Take a break. You can't learn it. But he had tears coming down his face. He was falling over every minute. It was a miracle he didn't come home with broken bones and stuff, but he wouldn't stop trying to ride that bike. And at the end of the day, he could ride the bike. He was that stubborn. And then my girl, Robin... She was a little bit more, hey, I see what my brothers are doing. They're pretty crazy. I'm going to just take it as it comes. And sure enough, when the time was right, it was a very easy event, I think, for, for Connie and Robin, for mom to go out, let her ride the bike, and there she goes. And the only reason I'm saying that is to emphasize that we're all really different. And we're strange, some of us. I mean, <laughs> uh, and we need, but God wants us to love each other. He loves us. He wants us to get along. Pardon me? I amen, brother. And I resemble it too. So we do enjoy community and family, and it's centered around the person of Jesus. And he knits us together in love, it says in Colossians, and it's so unique. And by the way, you know, we are really different, but something happens really neat when you pray with somebody. Any differences you might have, they just kind of melt away. Um, 
it might take a couple times praying with somebody, but as you pray with somebody and both of you put your hearts to the Lord, I don't care how different you are, the Lord kind of binds you together. And it's a real peaceful, wonderful thing that can happen in those situations. You, you should see our prayer group. I won't bring attention to them, but we're different. There's a, anyway, chapter 2, let's get into the passage. That's what we're here to do, right? Chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. This is the second reason John's writing the book. Remember, the overall theme is he wants our joy to be full. He wants to have this fullness of his kids walking with the Lord and enjoying his fellowship. And so his second reason, which dovetails into that, is my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. I mentioned this is the second reason that John gives. And, and we know it's his reason because I'm writing these things to you because, or we are writing these things to you. So the first reason that he wants our joy to be full, the second reason that we may not sin, I'll give you a sneak preview. The third reason is in 2.26, and it's a warning about false teachers. And then the fourth reason is in chapter 5, verse 13, to give us assurance of our eternal life in Christ. But anyway, my little children, this is how intimate John was and how he felt about us and his kids in the faith. It's a, it's a word, technion. I'm not a Greek guy, but that's what, that's what it looks like to me. And it refers to a little child. So this is a real tender appeal from the Apostle John. It's a, it's a term of affection. Jesus used this term when he was talking to his disciples before his death. It means little born ones. And, and, and this is important because we got to recognize that this is a letter to believers. It's to believers. So we're assuming now that everybody, because later in this passage, we're going to see some language, walking in darkness, walking in light, and he calls liars and stuff, but he's, he's talking to believers. So we just want to be realistic that even as believers, we can not be looking too good. And we want, to, we want to make an effort to change that if we need to. And he's writing that you may not sin. Um, the last three verses of chapter 1, if you go back and look at it with me, he says in verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So these verses presuppose that we do continue sinning, unfortunately, after we become believers. It's a bummer, but it's true, and we all know that. Um, probably, well, we just all know that. We aren't perfect. Um, we want to serve Jesus with our lives. And what should be happening is this sin situation should be getting cleaned up. We, God, God will do that work in us. He's going to start cleaning us up. We don't have to carry the burden of thinking, i got to be perfect before I come to him. Because the beauty of our Lord is he just forgives us. He says, come to me just the way you are. And I'm going to love you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to, I'm going to cover you. And... Uh, and you're forgiven in my Father's eyes if you do that. But beyond that, we've, we're still getting cleaned up. There's a process going on, isn't there? Sometimes it's kind of painful. It's, doggone it, I thought I was over that. Um, I, I love J. Vernon McGee, and he tells a story about a preacher that was making this point once that, that, that nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. And, uh, and he was getting all riled up about it and teaching and and he says, does anybody in this auditorium know a perfect person? And the auditorium was dead quiet. And he, and he repeats again, does anybody know a perfect person? And uh, finally, at the auditorium dead quiet, a little guy in the back raises his hand. And he goes, you, sir, do you know a perfect person? <laughs> and uh, he goes, well, I've heard about him. Kind of a little sheepish guy. And he goes, well, who is he? And he says, it's my wife's first husband. <laughs> so, so you see, we, we might use people to compare, but we're in this boat, you guys. We're, we're getting cleaned up. Let me read Psalm 32 to you because it's just such a beautiful picture 
and, and, and it's really about the blessedness of forgiveness in the Lord Jesus. And I'm just going to read through it, um, read through it kind of slowly, and we can chew on it together. So good. Psalm 32, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, it meant before he confessed, before he got honest with the Lord, he says, when I kept silent, my, gro- my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Sometimes the conviction of the Holy Spirit can feel very heavy, you know, if, if we're in that lifestyle where we haven't given ourselves to God there can be a weight, and that's because God loves you, and he wants to draw you to himself, and there will be that weight. I know I experienced that in my life before I gave my life to the Lord. He says in verse 4, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. In other words, that the person that's confessed their sin and they're, they're right with God, there's going, to be this, there's going to be this thing where things aren't going to affect them as much. The great waters, the troubles of this world, God's going to help. They're, you're not going to avoid all troubles, but it says the great waters will not come near to him who's, who's confessed their sin. In verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, shall, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is the blessedness of forgiveness, that lifting of the weight. Remember the song we used to sing? He who trusts in the Lord, you guys know it. Mercy shall surround him. Back to our passage. Okay, so John is talking to us, his kids. And, you know, think about it. If you're walking with the Lord and you're blessed enough to have kids, doesn't it hurt when you see your own kids sinning? Doesn't it just like go, oh, dang it? And it hurts. And John is, is conveying that to us, that he doesn't want, he, it hurts him. It hurts our Heavenly Father when we're sinning. And why does it hurt us? It's because we know it's hurting them, and we love them. Sin causes a break in fellowship. And we've all experienced this in our lives. It happens towards God, and it happens towards others in our life from time to time as we sin. And then confession, it brings healing. It brings healing. Maybe some of us in this room tonight just need to confess some stuff. I'm not going to make anybody do it. That's between you and the Lord. But it'll it'll start a healing process if you can do that. Um, And then the other thing is we know that rebellion and sin against God does not end well, and it creates a hard road. So we just are saddened. You know, we're saddened if we see our kids or anybody we love going down this hard road. So we mourn for them. We pray for them. We want them to experience God's love, and this is John's heart for us, that you may not sin. But it says there, up there, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. And here's the good news for the believer, Paul speaking of Jesus in Hebrews 7, 24, 25, talking about Jesus, but he, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to him come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. To the uttermost means completely and forever. Jesus is able to save completely and forever. So if you're here tonight and you haven't, you've placed your faith in Jesus and you felt that hand a little heavy on you, just give it up to the Lord Jesus. He will set you free. Now for the believer, Jesus is continually advocating for us before his father. Our sin's covered in Jesus. He's our advocate. He's our attorney. We know that the enemy's there. He's the accuser. He's going, look at that guy. Look at that guy. And Jesus says, dad, father, he's one of ours. He's one of mine. And we're covered 
in Jesus, his blood. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness we have in Jesus. We just read it in Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. That's an awesome place. If you're a believer, we got to just be thanking the Lord. We, that's why we can always come to the Lord with a thankful heart if, we, if we're believers in Jesus. We've been forgiven, you guys. What a blessing. Verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Strong word. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So this word, it says, by this we know that we know him. This is that word, you guys have heard it, gnosko. It's an experiential, experiential knowledge. It means that we've experienced him in our lives. We've experienced him working in our lives. And like I said, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes he's prodding us by his Holy Spirit. But how do we know him? We spend time with him. We've experienced his working in our life. And we walk with him and talk with him. I want to encourage you guys just to walk with him and talk with him. And I know you do. You're here on a Wednesday night on World Series Game 7, right? You guys are like awesome. Very spiritual group. But we want to walk with him and we want to talk with him. That's how we and, and have a relationship with him. We want to keep that relationship healthy. We want to obey him. And remember, what John is doing here is he's giving us assurance, and he, and he wants us to have joy. This isn't about whether or not somebody's saved or not. This is about you could be a believer, and, um, and you're not keeping his commands, and, you know, and John calls that person a liar you, you, as far as walking in the light. You're not really walking in the light unless we're really seeking him in this thing. Um, now, how can we be assured John is saying, if we keep his commandments. Now, what commandment is he talking about? Um, th this is really love being expressed in practical ways. That's what the commandment, and there's really a bunch of references to this type of commandment. I, I looked at uh, chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. There's lots of practical commandments from the Lord in that passage. I'm going to read a few of them to you. There, there's a bunch of them. There's like 20 of them, but comfort each other, edify each other. Recognize those who labor among you. Esteem them highly. Be at peace among yourselves. Warn the unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Be patient with all. Pursue what is good for yourselves and others. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks. Don't quench the spirit, etc., etc. Go and read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and just chew on those things and say, Lord, help me to do these things in an increasing way. And, and, then, and, and I know that's happening. Every, every face I look at in here is doing these things. And, and I know you should feel comfortable uh, if, you're, if you're seeking to do these things in your life that uh, you're walking in the light. There's no other reason to do all these things unless we're responding to the love God showed to us. Other passages to go chew on, 1 Corinthians 13, you guys know it well. Romans 12. Romans 12, you know, these things were spoken by Jesus, and they were lived by Jesus, and then Paul amplified all these things when he got into his epistles. We had a, a young gal come to our church body about a year, three, year and a half ago, something like that. The young gal's name was Brittany, and um, we were having a pastor's meeting one day, and Brittany came through the door, and she was really beat up by the world. She, I think she may have been a believer as a child, but her life, you know, it was, she had a hard life. And in, in addition to that, she had a uh, condition. She had diabetes from the time she was three years old. Very serious and complex form of diabetes. And so she was depressed about that. She, she said, I remember when we first met with her, she said, I can't believe God would put somebody and give them this kind of an affliction from such a young age. But what happened, this story, we, she came in, we were kind of in a pastor's meeting, Jeannie and Priscilla were there, we went over, we talked to her, um, got to know her a little bit, she was just weeping and crying and um, had really struggled and uh, 
anyway, here's a connection. And this is, this is love. This is love being expressed. And um, we were able to get her a place to live. She needed that. She had terrible roommate problems where there's lots of not good stuff going on. She needed to remove herself from that situation. We were able to get her a place to live and, and do some things that were really neat in her life. And, and then she was uh, ministered to from our young adults. Uh, Jacob does a young adults ministry every Thursday. My daughter Robin goes to that. And a lot of the, there was connections there for Brittany to surround herself with believers. And she struggled and yet she was really growing, and the love of God was being expressed to her through the word, through believers, through practical help, and we really did see her do well. And we, we found Brittany passed away about oh, a month ago. She was that, that diabetes that she had. She lived alone, and um, it got to a point where I think she went into what they call a diabetic coma one night. Her medicine was off that night, and so it was a sad thing, and... Uh, I think she was about 32 or 33. So, you know, we moved her out of the apartment, and today I wrote her dad a letter, and I just said that, because uh, one of the things when he came up, Bob Garrison, who you guys know, he helped meet with the dad and helped move things out of the apartment, and he was just a broken man, you know, of course. He's lost his daughter. And, uh, but one of the things he asked, he goes, was she happy? Was she happy? And... Uh, and about, um, it's funny because I guess she had texted Robin, uh, my daughter, a, a message about two weeks before that. And Brittany loved to fish. And she had texted a message with a big smile on her face and she had caught a great big trout. And so things were going better for her. And yet the Lord took her at that point. So now the chance to minister to her is gone because she's with the Lord. But the dad. And so I got to write the dad a letter today and I said, we love Brittany. I'm sure she's with the Lord. We, she got to know, I told her about the picture with a smile on her face and just something to soften his grief and to let him know that she was fine. And I, I guess the reason I'm sharing this is because, okay, this person's gone. Now there's somebody else we can minister to. This is taking Jesus' commandments and keeping them. It's just expressing love where you get opportunity to do it. And all of us have tons of opportunity around us. And you don't have to overwhelm yourself with it because God doesn't want you to do that. But take the time, you know, maybe one person here in a few more weeks, another person, and express love. It comes from the Lord. That's walking in the light. I don't know a better way to explain what this practical thing is that, that John's talking about, walking in light, because we keep his commands. We're, not, we're, we're moved by something to express that kind of love. You know, um, these aren't legal things. This isn't more law. You know, keep the law of love. Keep the law of love. This is, um, these are family matters. This is the way God wants us to treat each other in our family. And are we doing these things in an, an increasing way? Is God's spirit changing and transforming us as Jesus promises he will? It's an ongoing thing. So we just keep letting him do it. And we keep being involved in somebody's life, even, you know, and sometimes we're not capable of that. I understand that. But boy, by God's spirit, you can be, you'll be amazed at how many people he lets you minister to. And, uh, and you'll, be, you'll have joy. This is, the, this is one of the secrets that John's talking about, having joy, walking in the light. Now, John himself was like that. He was, he was reshaped. His inner man was reshaped. He changed. He went from the son of thunder, you know, a hothead with a big temper, to a loving, meek disciple who God preserved till a ripe old age for in his instance because God had work for him. But you guys have heard this story, Luke 9, 54, 56, when Jesus was walking with his disciples. It, it, they were heading to Jerusalem, and they wanted to pass through a Samaritan village, but the Samaritans wouldn't receive them. And so it says, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? This was what was in John's heart. Do you see? He wasn't this loving, meek, old, refined saint at this point. He says, let's, let's cook them. Let's have a Samaritan barbecue or whatever that is. But, Jesus, but he turned, Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then they went to another village. 
And unfortunately for me, and I think for some of us, sometimes we just don't recognize the spirit that we're of. We're going, oh, where did that come from? Dang it, I don't want to feed that guy. I want to feed this other guy that the Lord, the Lord wants to develop in me. And sometimes I'm surprised. I go, oh, yuck. But it's okay. Just hang in there. Go back to the cross. We want to let all these changes take place. They took place in John. He became more like the Lord he was serving. And this should be happening to you and me. We don't just get it down. And, and we don't get it down when we're 50, 60, 70, 80. We keep doing it. We keep becoming more like the Lord. We're, this should be happening. This is what we want. Sounds simple, right? It's not really a heavy theological concept. But it's life, life transforming if we allow God to do these things, to become more like him. I think the key here is abiding and staying close. Pursue the relationship even when we don't feel like it. This will enable us to walk increasingly as, as he walks. We don't want to be those liars that John's talking about. He says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. Doesn't mean he's not saved. He, he's going to be in heaven, but we don't want to be called that. I hear you, John. Thank you. And then in verse 7, he says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So, it sounds a little confusing. This is, an old, this is not an old commandment. It's a new commandment, a new commandment I'm writing, but it's not a new commandment. And the, what we need to look at here is this isn't new in the form of a new commandment in the sense of legalism. John's not saying, here's another burden for you to carry. He's not adding to the 613 or whatever they were laws that the Jews had to take care of. He's just saying, I want you to love. And in verse 8, this, the word for new, it doesn't mean new in terms of time. It means new in terms of freshness. You see, all these commands are old commands. The Old Testament said to do, do justly and to love mercy. Over and over again, God was appealing to his people to treat each other in a righteous way. So it's not new, but what this means is, it, the word for this is, means fresh. It means it's the way, it's new in the way we approach an old command, which was in God's word from the beginning. God's word doesn't change. He's not a man that he should change or a son of man that he should tell a lie. So this is in God's word to love one another, to care for the needy, to have compassion on one another. And for sure, when the disciples walked with Jesus, they saw this old commandment being lived out in a brand new way. And that's the newness of an old commandment, if you will. The way, treated, the way Jesus treated people. He met needs. He cared. He met people where they were at. He lived the commandment to love in an entirely new and refreshing way. And this is what John is reminding these guys of. John 13, 34, 35. Listen to what Jesus says. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus elevated an old command to a new height. It seems unattainable, but up in that passage, it says the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. I like what Sam shared. You know, when we look at the world around us, and there's a little bit about the world at the end of this passage tonight about don't get caught up in it. it you know, we could look at it and just get so sucked into it. I mean, what a, you know, it's going, going down, you know, and everything. And... Uh, but, he, but Sam says, you know, that's an opportunity for us as believers to shine a little bit brighter. And we, can, we, will make, we will look so different from the world if we can start to live by these commandments that Jesus is, that John is suggesting we do. And I'm not going to get political. No. Jacob said that four times the other day, right, on Sunday. I'm not getting political. Let me go get political. No, not going to. So we're not going to talk politics, but... You guys know what I mean. We, we, we really have an opportunity. This day and age, as dark as it is, if we're living in these ways, we're, we're going to look really different to a lot of people that need Jesus, and they're going to be drawn to you guys. Now, verse 9 says, He who says he is in the light 
and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, I just want to make the note again, this is a letter to believers. It's sad, but some of us who claim to believe, and I believe we do, can actually have a hatred or an enmity towards a brother, and we we shouldn't have it. We should let it go. We should start praying for that brother. And I know I'm like this sometimes, so this isn't to lay anything on you. It's it's all of us, you know, if we, if we love our brother, we're abiding in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going. So praise the Lord. You guys are here, and there's a guy up here trying to share the word with you, and you're listening, and we're all listening, and I'm listening to what God's trying to do in all of our lives. And so this is a letter to believers, and John wants his kids to grow out of that state. If we're in that state, he wants us to keep moving forward and moving out with Jesus, and this is why God provides the church to a dying world. We're supposed to bring life, to bring light, to bring love, to bring reproduction. That doesn't mean we go around giggling all the time, right? I mean, some people, you know, I got to be a happy little Christian. That's not necessarily true. Sometimes we're really serious little Christians, but there there still should be some love emanating from our life towards others, right? Okay, so, um, and so if anybody of you feel pressure to be giggly, giggly all the time, yeah, you don't have to be, but you shouldn't be grumpy, grumpy all the time either, (laughs) but you you want to be real and you want to bring light and love to others around us. Um, this is one of John, John does contrast. You know how he talks about light and darkness and you're in sin, you're not in sin. He, he's a guy that brings contrast into thing. And so he's talking about light and darkness here. And light is God's realm of truth, righteousness, purity. John eight twelve says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So God is light. He dwells in light. And I, it's, it's beyond our understanding. I don't understand what this light is. Someday we're going to be in it and we're going to see it. I mean, the God, the, uh, what was it? Peter, James, and John got to see Jesus and it says his clothes were whiter than any earthly, earthly launderer could ever get it. Just whiter than white. He dwells in light. Psalm 104 verse 2, you are clothed with honor and majesty who covers yourself with light as a garment. 1 Timothy 6.16, who, he's talking about God who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So light is this place, and I think we get to hang out there, you guys. We're going to probably need our little glorified bodies and stuff before we do that, but it's going to be cool. I don't know what it's, I might need sunglasses, but um, interesting. But darkness, on the other hand, it's, that's what we kind of live in. We live in a world of error. It's evil. There's ignorance. There's confusion. A lot of lost people. But what John is saying here is that loving our brother is evidence that we're abiding in the light. So that's something we can all just search our own souls, and I'll, and I'll, I'll keep searching my soul. And you guys got to promise me. We're going to write it all out today. I promise you I'm going to start. No, but seriously, we, we, can, we can take this up within our hearts with the Lord. Lord, help me to be that person that's loving other people, and especially those within the body and, and the other believers. Verse 12, he says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Now he's going to repeat that in a little bit different way. He says, I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. I just want to point at the outset, this applies to men and women. So we're, this is just the way they address people, you know, the, the male thing or whatever it is. But for all of us, 
This applies to all of us. And it's an interesting repetition that he does. But what this does, it emphasizes the fact that John intends all these exhortations for every person in the body of Christ, whether we're young in the Lord, whether we're old in the Lord, whether we're just strong and getting it going in the Lord. and We haven't walked with him for that long. So we can look at this as levels of maturity in the Lord. It talks about little children and the young in Christ. The word there is technia, little born ones, childlike in their faith, but their sins are forgiven for his namesake and they've known the Father. And what we want to do is we want to kind of grow out of that childlike part. And, and you know, some people have been coming to church for years and they're still kind of little children in that way. And we want to grow. We want to grow from there. God still loves loves us, and, and those little kids are going to be in heaven, but the little born ones, sometimes Christians stay in that position for a long time. The second time he writes to little children, he uses a different word, and it means immature little folk. Paideia, that's Greek. Don't know what it means, except for it told me that it means immature little folk. So <laughs> even the little children who are immature little folk, God loves you, and you're forgiven. Then he writes to fathers, so he doesn't go right to the young men. Fathers are the older saints, perhaps known Jesus for many years, and maybe more experienced. Um, The longer you've walked with the Lord, the more you're able to see how faithful God is, even when we're faithless. And that gives you a great, it helps in our walk. It gives us a firmer firmer foundation. We've, um, We've seen how secure and how steadfast his nature is. And we've seen it over years, you know. And uh, it's, a, it's neat to be, get older in the Lord and just know that he's immovable. He doesn't change. You know, he's a solid rock. And then he talks to young men. And so perhaps these young guys aren't as mature as the fathers or haven't had the experience that the fathers have had. But they've learned the secret of overcoming the enemy, which is God's word. It says, young men, you're strong in the Lord, and you're strong in the word. Psalm 119, 911, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we got some awesome young men in this church, and I just want to see them hold fast to the word and grow in the Lord and growing to be those old guys that are really in that spot where they're just saying, wow, God's amazing, and you can't be shaken. The, the longer you walk with the Lord, I believe you keep coming back to him, it's harder and harder to shake us off path of our, of our faith. So keep on keeping on. So I don't know why he does it in this order, but for sure this emphasizes that the instruction he's given in this letter is for all believers. It's for the young, it's for the old, and it's for everybody in between. It's for all of us. And finally, I'm going to close with this section on the world because uh, we do want to share in communion tonight. Remember what Jesus did for us. He says in verse 15, still trying to help us, you know, walk with him and just share that joy with him, that fellowship. He says, verse 15, do not love the world. It's interesting. I said, what kind of love is that? And so I looked it up and it's agape. It's the kind of unconditional love. And so You know, if you like the world, you're probably in a better spot than if you agape the world. If you know what I mean, agape means unconditional love. That's the kind of love that God has for us. It's unconditional. And that's the kind of, that's the word that he's saying here. He says, don't agape the world. Don't have this love for the world or the things that are in the world. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So this can be a big stumbling block to us, and especially if we're younger in the Lord. Um, And the world here, it's not a reference to the natural world, the beautiful creation God made. We We can appreciate and enjoy that and love it. We don't have to worship the creation, but for sure God gave us, gives us his creation to enjoy and to participate in it. I love the mountains. I love the world. I love lakes and streams and the ocean. But this isn't that world. It's not the nature. This is the worldly system that mankind sets up, and it just gets messy. 
You know, the only peace that's ever going to be in this world is when the Prince of Peace is back in the world. And then we're going to see things get cleaned up in the Middle East and whatever. But we look forward to that day. But in the meantime, we have work to do. But our world, its systems are pretty messy. And there's three areas that will always tend to get us off track and get us off track with Jesus and keep us from walking in the light. Lust of the flesh talks about that. All the perversities, desires of our flesh. Any of us who have a body are aware of that, okay? That's everybody here. Lust of the eyes, coveting things we see. Pride of life, a desire to be on top, kind of that arrogant want to lord it over other people. Those aren't things we should desire as Christians. We want to uh, not be drawn to those things. We, in Jesus, for sure, we see no respect or love. He, he wasn't looking for position. He wasn't looking to get wealthy. He obviously wasn't looking for... Uh, to be a partier and sexual whatever. Jesus was Jesus, and he had no love for the world. And we're, we're, we need to be careful about our love for the world. It's intoxicating, though, and it can, it can be really subtle to us and can get us off track in our walk if we get drawn into that stuff. I remember when I was a young guy, before I knew the Lord, I think I was about 25 or 6, I, get, I came to the Lord when I was 30, and we went to, on this, we went to this dinner um, it was up at Squaw Valley, and there's all these people like that had money, you know. And I thought that was pretty cool because they had money. And uh, they were friends of uh, my brother and a uh, big group of people, probably about 20 at this huge table. And, uh, you know, the beautiful mountains there couldn't be any more gorgeous. And one guy kind of gets up to give a toast, and he says, I just think it's so wonderful that we're sitting here at the top amongst the top one or two percent you know what i mean and i'm and i'm going to tell you i didn't know the lord and i'm going yeah that's cool one of the top one or two percent you know the, they're so whatever they were affluent or whatever and i and uh, it's it, it's i don't think anybody here is, has that problem but i did at that point and my sister she was wiser than me i go wow that guy that's pretty cool huh that we're part of that top one or two percent she just shook her head she goes that guy's so full of hot air or whatever so she set me straight, and uh, I love my sister. But um, anyway, the world, you know what I mean? Don't love the world. There's nothing in this world that, that has to offer that can compare to the Lord Jesus Christ. And even when you paint this world as all shiny, guess what? It ain't. We find out, don't we? So it's temporary, and our lives are short. Um, I think I'll ask the worship team to come up because we're going to do communion in a minute. And in the meantime, I just want to mention once more that if you're here tonight and you haven't experienced that forgiveness that God gives through Jesus, go for it. Go for it. Just say, yes, Lord. If you're too uh, shy to raise your hand, come up and talk to me afterwards. But I do want to give you an opportunity to do that right now, just to say yes to Jesus. And then we're going to share in communion. But, um, Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that you give us such sound advice. Thanks for your servant, John, who loves us and loves you and loves your church so much that he took the time to write this letter. And so, Father, I just pray for all my brothers and sisters here. I pray that you just keep moving us in that direction of expressing our love to one another, not carrying grudges and not, uh, you know, not being separated or out of fellowship because of things going on inside. I just pray that you'd cleanse each one of us from those kinds of attitudes and help us to love and walk the way Jesus did. And uh, Lord, I also pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, that they would just say yes to you tonight. Obviously, you've drawn them here and you love them and you have a perfect gift of forgiveness for them in your son, Jesus, and they just need to say yes. So if there is anybody here tonight in that spot where you just need to let go and say, yes, Lord, I want you in my life. I want to walk with you. You want to give your life to Jesus. Just show me by putting up your hand. Nobody else can see. Everybody's praying. And if there's anybody here that wants to come down and talk to Lexi or Bethany and I or I, and you want to do that, you want to pray that prayer, we'll pray with you tonight after we worship and after we share in communion. But... um Lord, we thank you. We just thank you that we get to now remember what Jesus did for us. 
and we just ask your mercies and blessings in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So if